Hey guys, Corey from Aquarium Co-op. Today is Breeding Fish for Profit Part 4. Uh, we're going to focus on what to do if you don't have a local fish store. And uh, so that's going to cover things like selling online, selling on Craigslist, selling on uh, Facebook, all those types of things, shipping. Uh, and it's, it's definitely more than one episode, but a lot of you keep asking, well, I don't have a local store, blah, 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 so this info doesn't apply to me, but... It will, you know, it makes it so that the previous episodes do apply to you because you can breed fish and you can share and things like that. So, uh, let's get started. So first, know that if you have a local store, and I should clarify, whenever I say local store, I mean a mom and pop shop. So an independently owned fish store. Now, that doesn't include PetSmart, Petland, Petco, all those types of deals where they're bound by contracts and they can't buy fish from you. Uh, things like that, or some of you expressed uh, your local store just simply won't buy fish from you, and that could be as well, you know. So let me start by addressing the won't buy fish from you even though they are a local store. Chances are either A, they don't want to work with you, and they're just being nice and saying we don't buy fish from customers, B, they've never met a breeder that actually isn't a waste of their time, and that that's something big to be said there is, you know, people get hit up all the time. I want to say every other day at my store, someone calls and says, what will you give me for this fish? And it might not even be a breeder. Let's be like, well, I got a really big placosmus. Surely it's worth money. Or, oh, I've got these Oscars or Jack Dempsey's or Guppies or whatever it is. Or every day in a fish store, we're dealing with people that want money for their fish and it's easier to just say we don't buy fish than it is to negotiate a price on lots of things so you might be just getting that snap answer of we don't buy fish and uh, so that's why you know we've covered in previous episodes you want to come to your local store with you know letterhead and you're gonna have your contact information you're gonna have the price for your fish you're gonna bring them a sample you're gonna do all those things to get your foot in the door to show them that you are different than all the other people they're talking to every day because every day someone's a big breeder they're making this they're gonna sell it to you blah 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 we've heard it all a million times and you've got to make sure that you stand out different uh, I guarantee everyone who wants to stay in business wants to deal with a breeder who is making them money now Maybe you're not making the money. Maybe you're offering them a crazy price that they go they can get it 10 times cheaper. I've had people say that uh, they're always controlled by price. And that's true. I, I don't fault any store for saying, well, I can buy it cheaper over here. That's business. And so either A, you got to convince them that you have a better product and it's going to be healthier. And I would also say you should just beat that price. You know, so... My logic is this, when I'm a breeder, and when I'm a store, and things like that, when I can buy a fish halfway across the world, fly it into my airport, drive and pick it up, and bring it back to my store, and it is cheaper than you that lives 20 minutes away driving it to my store, why wouldn't I do that? And so, if you can't beat that price, you're either breeding a fish that you shouldn't be breeding, or B, you're not doing enough to compete. And yes, realize, we all know in previous episodes, we are competing with overseas and things like that, where they might get free heat, they might have cheaper labor, they might have all these things, uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of fish they never, ever, ever breed because it's too labor-intensive, or it gets too hot where they are. You know, like a lot of countries don't even make white clouds. Why? Because they can't keep it cold enough. Um, you know, and there's things that are lots of care, like Corydoras tend to be very expensive overseas. Uh, lots of trophies, and a lot of a lot of the cichlids are too. Um, I think that's mostly just because they don't need to breed as many. But you know, there are lots of things you can compete on. But realize that if you can't make a guppy, you know, and this is a breeder, you know, this is breeder knowledge here, but. Let's say I order 300 guppies at a time uh, from overseas. They're probably going to cost me somewhere between, let's say, 30 cents 
and a dollar, depending on who it is, what strain it is, that type of thing. Uh, then they got to land in the country. Then I'm going to be using a transshipper, so they're going to ship them to me. So I'm also going to pay shipping on top of that. And then, typically with transshippers and things like that, there's no guarantee on the fish. That being said, usually you get pretty good fish, because if fish don't arrive to you alive time and time again, you stop ordering. So it's in their best interest to send you healthy fish. Uh, and then I gotta go pick it up and I gotta bring it back to my store. And for a lot of times for me, that's two, three o'clock in the morning. And so if you are coming to me and trying to sell me guppies and I would rather bring them in for, out of country, drive to the airport at midnight, unload them in my store at two o'clock in the morning, that should tell you that your price or quality or something is so far off, I'd rather torture myself. So, that being said, my store, I love to buy from breeders at an appropriate price because it does save me a lot of work and that's what you want to provide to your client as well. And that's the fish store becomes your client. Alright, so let's say that you don't have the local store. You've only got chains. They won't work with you from contracts. You're, you're pulling your hair out going, oh, I'm getting nowhere. So let's examine ways to sell the excess fish that you are making off. And uh, we'll start with, in my opinion, the worst way, and that is shipping fish. And that could be you could ship it to a wholesaler. I know people that do that. They'll ship them to a wholesaler. Uh, it could be shipping it on Aquabid. There's eBay. Um, a lot of people ship plants, and that one's not so bad because uh, plants don't die nearly as much. But imagine this scenario of... You breed, I'm going to pick a, a fish here, let's just say it's a Trophius, it's a cichlid, Trophius debosii. And the wholesaler, let's say a local wholesaler, wholesaler would have given you $2.50. Let's say that on eBay and Aquabid you can get 6 or $7 and you sell them in groups of 6, maybe 10 if you're lucky, maybe. Uh, so already, the... Part of the problem is, so let's say, let's use a group of 10. You've sold 10 to someone on Aquabid, and already they're fighting you on shipping. So, like, you'll look at this on Aquabid and eBay and stuff like that. Basically, you've got two camps. You've got the people that want it priority, which means two to three days to ship it, and they don't want any guarantee. Well, they want a guarantee, but you won't offer them a guarantee. And then there's overnighting. And so the priority might cost, let's say, it's $20 with heat pack and everything but overnight is 45 or 50 dollars and so if they're buying 10 fish and there were seven dollars each they're at 70 dollars so they're looking at 90 or they're looking at 110 something like that but let's say you go ahead and ship them overnight and they're they're willing to pay for that most people aren't but let's say they were you ship them to them and they get delayed and so you're going well i can file a claim go ahead do that process and then realize maybe your four hours of time with fighting with the post office or FedEx or whatever it was trying to convince them that the fish didn't arrive alive and didn't arrive in the time specified and then you shipped it the correct month. Like most people don't know that when you ship something in the months of November, December and January, no one guarantees any of them. Like I can put it on a plane and pay for insane next flight guaranteed service and it w might not ship out on that flight and then when you go to make a claim they go well clearly here in the fine print it says during these three months we never guarantee that there's too many packages we can't and so you paid extra money and you don't find that out until after uh, you've already had the problem so but let's say you send it out and let's say it's not delayed let's just say it arrives and so let's say the post office delivers it at 10 a.m. and the gentleman or the woman that has bought your fish doesn't get home from work until 5.30. So now they've sat on someone's doorstep for, what is that, eight hours? Could have been freezing cold, which is okay. I, I prefer a cold than I do the converse, which is hot. If it's hot, they just boil. I've had, I've had shrimp shipped to me slash uh, shipped them out where they literally show up and there's nothing in the bag and it's just kind of a, a pinkish water they literally boiled slash melted in there and uh, so let's say they arrive they open the box they got home oh man they're super disappointed three of them are dead so now 
you have a few options. You can refund their money on the three. They won't be happy with that because they've paid shipping and uh, you know they didn't get the number they wanted. You can ship them out more and make them pay shipping. They won't be happy with that either because they don't want to pay shipping twice and you've already screwed up once so they're going, well, what are the odds you're not going to screw up again? Uh, you can also, uh, you know, what I did when I was shipping online is I always shipped replacement fish at my cost, which ate up all your profits. Um, but that actually makes the customer happy. They got the fish they wanted for the amount they wanted to pay. The other thing that people do uh, will refund an exorbitant amount of money. So let's say you ship 10 fish, three of them didn't arrive alive. You would refund all of their money minus the shipping. So you made zero dollars on your fish. You didn't lose any money, but you did lose a lot of time. Now, people are going, well, that can't happen every time. It doesn't happen every time, but let's say it happens 20% of the time. One out of every five orders is going to have a major hang up. And that hang up could be they forgot to update their PayPal address and now it's going to the wrong house they moved away from. It could be that it just got stuck somewhere. It didn't make the connecting flight and now you have a problem. It could be that you didn't think shipping from Seattle to Maine, it would have diverted down to Texas and they boiled down there and then they continued shipping. There's all types of things that can go wrong with that. You know, so let, let us know that that is the hardest money to make. It also is not uh, the most money you can make, you know, because the problem is, even on Aquabid, let's say you're moving those trophies, a wholesaler or a store or something like that might have might have bought them off you uh, 30 at a time, 50 at a time, where when you're moving 10, maybe you're moving 10 every week or two, and on top of that, you're running the slim margins so you can be competitive. You're in a world market at that point. You're competing with everyone. When you're selling to a local store or a local wholesaler, you're competing with basically your state. And so... Kind of in the previous videos, when we talk about how the price is falling out of the bottom on angelfish and things like that, go into, let's say, like Aquabid and the angelfish market and look how many different people are selling angelfish and how far the prices have come down. And then you want to jump into that market. And what makes you the special one? Are you a guy that everyone knows? Mm, probably not. Do you have something that no one else has? Probably not, but maybe you do. Or are you selling the cheapest? Like mo one of those things kind of has to happen. And so if you don't have something crazy, crazy rare and you don't have a name built for yourself on Aquabid, you have to go the cheap route, which means you're just undercutting even more. So you're doing the same amount of work as everyone else for the least amount of money. And then know that in a month, three more guys have come in underneath you already. And so it's a constant race to the bottom. So I'm not a big fan of shipping online. I've done it, you know, and this is, this is coming from a guy that let's say has made, I'm just going to pick a, a number that I know I've done. I've sold at least $10,000 worth of fish online. And I know enough to know that I don't want to do it. You guys ask me all the time, will you ship this fish? And the reality is I just, I don't want to. Because even if things go right, it was the most amount of work I did in my day to make sure that shipment landed correctly to you. So, but let's talk about other ways to unload these fish. So, Maybe I'll just group them. Well, I won't group them together, but let's talk like the next worst way, which would be Craigslist. And Craigslist is the worst, second worst way because typically the average clientele on Craigslist are looking for a bargain. Nothing wrong with that. You can see my other videos where we talk about getting tanks for cheap on Craigslist and things like that. But know that the, the shopper there is already looking for a bargain. So naturally, they're going to want to bargain with your prices. Uh, also, you either A, need to set up a meet where you're going to go meet them somewhere and hand them the fish. And that always kind of goes a little weird because people get weird like, so I got to meet you in the parking lot of Walmart to buy these fish. You know, and you're thinking, well, I don't want crazy people coming to my house. They're thinking, what's he trying to hide? Are these the last five fish that haven't died in his fish tank? Things like that. So you got to kind of wrestle with that to get where the meet's going to happen. Uh, if you if you let them come to your house, this is what I've learned. Uh, it's never a fast trans transaction. So like, let's say you walked into my fish room. One, now you know where I live. You know that's 
if you're if you're doing lots of commerce and lots of business, you're not going to want to have that happen because you think like, oh, it's not that bad until you're randomly just like working one Saturday and random dude is at your door and he's like, well, I was, I was in the neighborhood. I thought I'd stop by and see what you had. You know, it's awkward. But let's say they do come over and you're like, well, I kind of know this guy. Let him come over. And he wants to buy 10 year fish. It will literally take two to three hours. I guarantee it. And it's because they're going to go, ooh, what's this? What about that? Ooh, what about this? Ooh, ooh, I love to look at fish. Ooh, I love to talk about fish. I love to kick tires. And so now, your Saturday that you were going to get so much done, and you had a guy that's going to come buy some money or buy some fish, and then you're going to run to Lowe's or Home Depot, buy some parts, and build a few more tanks and do that. Totally shot. Done. Because you tried to sell one or two groups of fish through Craigslist. And you can do it, but it's, it's, it's a huge time suck. And people are going to ask questions and questions and questions and trying to barter you down. And then all the time this happens, you agree to a price. It's 20 cherry shrimp, $50. Let's say that you've worked out that deal. They show up and magically, oh, they only have $40 on them. Or... Oh, uh, will you throw 10 more shrimp in for 10 more dollars? Or, you know, it's always something. Rarely ever is it someone that showed up, had exact change for you, made the transaction, and left. That almost never happens. And so that's just the next most irritating way to get rid of fish. Uh, so the next one I would say would be like Facebook groups, like local Facebook groups, let's say. Uh, or like your local fish club, let's say they have a forum or something like that, because then you at least can rule out they're not a stranger. The people in those groups, uh, whether it's a Facebook group or a local fish club, they're not automatically bargain shoppers. They, they could literally just be someone looking for it, and they're willing to pay retail prices. That's great. That's a Yahtzee for you. Someone comes in and goes, yeah, I'll give you $4 of cherry shrimp, no problem. And you're going, oh, right, that's, that's good money. I'm making really good money here. Uh, and you feel a little bit better about bringing them over to your house. Maybe they've already been there before, or maybe you can meet up with them at the local meeting, or there's a get-together, and they're not weirded out. Because like, oh yeah, I'll bring you the fish at the meeting on uh, Saturday night. They're not thinking, oh yeah, he must kill lots of fish, something like that. You might already have a reputation. They kind of know who you are. And so that just goes a lot easier. And you might deliver six different groups of fish to that local meeting. Uh... So that works out because, you know, you, you might hang out there for an hour or two. You might be buying some stuff. You unloaded six groups of fish. And when you're in a public place like that, you can actually get a lot more sales. So when you're delivering fish and people are buying and stuff like that, all of a sudden people are going, well, what's this guy selling? It seems like everyone's buying from him. You might have lined up four more customers for the following weekend or the next meet or whatever it is. So you get a little bit of advertising when you do that in-person meet versus Craigslist. Not really going to happen. Uh, on Facebook, when you're doing this on Facebook and the forum, don't spam. Like, that's, when you start irritating people, they'd rather pay more money. And so, you might want to post a post once a month that's got like, oh, here's what I sell. And if you make good products, and, you know, by products I mean fish and things like that, other people will advertise for you. And you probably see this already when someone goes, oh man, I'm really trying to find some German red peacocks. I just can't find any. And someone chimes up and goes, oh, Steve, Steve makes those. He makes really great ones. You know, talk to Steve. And that's the time for you to chime in and go, oh yeah, I do read those. Let me know if you're interested. Send me a private message and don't just instantly slap, boom, here's the price list. Because you don't want to be that guy. You want to be the guy that, yeah, he's got nice fish. Go talk to him. And you want to take your prices out of the public view as much as possible because that lets people chime in. So, like, let's say someone recommends you being Steve, uh, even if you're a girl, you're Steve right now, and they recommend your fish, and you, you put, oh, yeah, I sell them for $11 each. You've now given the wiggle room for someone else to go, oh, well, uh, Melissa over here sells them for $6 each. So now you just got undercut. But if you just said, send me a private message, and they do, you can tell them your price, 
And it's much less likely someone else is going to swoop in and go, hey, you can get that cheaper. Oh, oh, that's a bad deal or whatever, you know. So it kind of protects your prices a little bit. Um, so, yeah, the Facebook groups, they work nice. And the local club groups work nice because uh, you can build a reputation as who you are much easier. And you can do the meeting places easier and things like that. Um, what else? So like, let's say you can actually go to your club meetings. Sometimes if you're a nobody, it's not a bad idea to try and brand yourself at the auctions. So like if there's a, a yearly auction or maybe there's auctions after each speaker or whatever it is, try and uh, put a few pairs of guppies in and say what they are say like a little bit of their lineage like if you order them from you know thailand atfg put that they're from atfg and then they're bred locally and they're made by you know guppiesrus.com or whatever your brand is if they'll allow it you know and uh or you know like there's there's people in our local club that might just say like fish by cory and pretty soon a few months in a row when they see fish show up fish by Cory. pretty soon they go, hey, Cory must breed fish, and pretty soon they start going to Cory directly as opposed to waiting for the auction or something like that. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to think of other places to sell the fish. Um, so if you were selling at all these places I just mentioned, realize that once you've done, you know, part four of this series where we're selling to all these places, you essentially have zero chance with a store. If one opens up, you might have a chance because you can say, oh, I was waiting for a store to open up. But once you've crossed the bridge and you're selling online to the local club, to the local forum, to on Craigslist, all those avenues, no store is gonna wanna touch you with a 10-foot pole. And, uh, you know, but if you don't have a local place anyway, that's fine. But I would rec I would maintain that most people have a store worth visiting within a few hours of them. I mean, there's obviously going to be some places that don't, and yeah, that sucks. Don't get me wrong. I, I I feel bad if you have to live in a place where you can't drive two or three hours, and there's not a local store. Oof, that's rough. Um, but if there is, it's it's worth trying to, uh, you know, marry up to that store, as I've mentioned. And, uh, or there should be a wholesale. There should be something, you know. But those are the tips for the people that don't have a local fish store. Um, it makes everything harder. And it's, it's maybe one of those things that maybe you don't become a fish breeder if you don't have a good place to unload it. It's almost better. I mean, you know, let's say you were... You know, you made uh, the best sandwiches in the world. If no one is local, like let's say you live in a small town that has, uh, you know, 5,000 people. It might not make sense to open a sandwich shop because there's not enough people to service. Likewise, yeah, you could ship. It's actually easier to ship a sandwich than it is fish. You could put a cold pack in there, ship it. And yet almost no one ships a sandwich, you know. So realize that it might not be for you like it might be like oh i just i can't make money off of this now that being said there are some very entrepreneurial people that can build a club or something like that and make a following you know but that being said if you can do that you're usually better just opening a fish store but i have seen people do it they like have taken a town or a big city that has like there's fish people but there's no club there's no local store stuff like that and they just start building you know this group and the group gets bigger and the group gets bigger and once you get a big enough group people start thinking about opening up fish stores and pretty soon you're a fish town so that could be you too but um you know realize that that's a lot of work and uh you know maybe not worth it um but yeah, let's let's talk about, you know, while we're talking about not having a local fish store, let's talk about buying things online because you don't have a local fish store, right? That That's a perfectly good problem to have. Um, I would say there's not really any loyalty online. You're just a number. 
there are places I like to use a breeder, like let's say gemco.com. I don't get paid by them. I just like John. I like the way he does business. I wish I could order online, but I have to call him and order every time. But I always get tons of insight from him, so that's that's kind of a win-win there. But you're essentially just looking for the cheapest price. Once you're online, all dry good vendors are doing the same thing you're going to do. They're going to cut everything down to the bone to who's the cheapest, right? And uh, I don't really know of any fish places that are worth ordering that have rewards programs to stay loyal to them. You know, there are some that do have reward programs, so they're just not the cheapest price. And no one's the cheapest on everything. So maybe you order fish food from, you know, people are going to freak out when I say this. But maybe you order from kensfish.com, which I'm not a fan of most of his foods. I know heresy, people are going, oh, you're an idiot, that type of thing. Don't get me wrong. His foods are perfectly okay for the price point they're at, I guess. I just find them to be too low of quality for what I actually feed. You know, honest, real talk there. That's just me. And uh, But let's say you order food from there because it's cheap. Let's say you order uh, your bulkheads and things like that and your fish room supplies from Gemco because they've got the best prices there. Maybe you're buying your heaters or you're heating the room or whatever, but maybe you're buying your heaters on eBay because you've bought... Uh, there's a bulk deal, something like that. Maybe you're buying, you're probably buying brine shrimp eggs from brine shrimp direct because that's pretty much the only place to buy it. They bring all the eggs in pretty much and then sell them to other places and they'll sell them to you. So if you're buying from somewhere else, either you're getting a lesser quality or you're buying something that's been repackaged from them, you know. So, um, but yeah, getting stuff shipped into you. And you, you probably are having to buy the fish that you want to breed also. And that's where I said, like, I think the first episode, when you're wanting to breed fish and analyzing cost, can you even get the fish? You know, like, let's say the Cipacromus I got out in my garage or my fish room there, I might try to have them shipped into me and they just arrive dead. They are known to be very sensitive shippers. So sometimes it's, can you even get the fish um, before you can make money on it? Can you get your hands on it? Uh, alive and healthy and in the right numbers and things like that can you afford it but yeah you're obviously gonna have to do a lot of stuff online uh, I would say in that scenario be a consumer online buy all your stuff online because you've got no local store to support and then support your locals as much as you can sell them on the Facebook groups and Craigslist and things like that that tends to be the best now, there are people watching this video that say, I make a ton of money shipping fish online. My hat's off to you. It's a lot of work. I don't think any of you that are making a ton of money shipping fish would say uh, it's, it takes no work or it's very easy. You know, I think all of us would agree that have done it that it's labor intensive and a time suck, so to speak. Compared to, you know, oh, you want six of my discus? Let me put them in a bucket or let me put them in a bag. There you go. Great. To, oh, I got to individually bag each one. I got to get the box ready. I got to put the styro liner in it. I got to put the bag in there in case one breaks open. I got to put my six discus in there. I got to package that up. Then I got to put a heat pack in, let's say, a paper bag. Roll that up. Tape it to the top. Close the flaps. Tape that. Print the shipping label double check the route it's going to take and make sure it doesn't get too cold or too hot on the way there and make sure I didn't miss a note about what day they wanted it shipped or any special directions. Then I put that in the box of stuff that's going to be shipped out. Hopefully I've got UPS or FedEx picking up from my facility instead of me driving it there. And then I need to email the customer if I don't already have software doing this and let them know the tracking number so they can start tracking it as well as soon as possible and then I have to follow up with them after it lands at their house see did it go okay are you okay with the fish are you happy with them things like that and that's gonna happen you're gonna spend Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays doing all those things and then the other days are gonna be spent cleaning up the mess slash breeding fish slash doing everything else and that becomes a full-time job so um, you know, as a hobbyist, find people that, you know, like what you're doing, sell to them at a reasonable price, make good money if you can, and, uh, you know, realize that it's horrible not to have a local fish store. You know, it's going to be really hard, or I should say labor-intensive, 
to have a 20 gallon tank that you need to sell 50 guppies out of 25 cherry shrimp or whatever that number was and some java moss every month and you've got only craigslist and facebook to try it on and you know you might not even have a local facebook group or something you just only got craigslist like oh geez that could be rough but that being said it will still be more money on the table than doing nothing you know it'll still fund your hobby and uh, you know some of the greats like Dorothy Reimer, who's kind of uh, you know I think they dub, she's dubbed now like the grandmother of of uh, aquarium plants and things like that because she started her fish room way way back when and this you know I try not to date her or anything but it might be in like the 60s right she start, had a fish tank started breeding mystery snails and she could get 50 cents for an adult mystery snail. Uh, and she would go and sell them to her local pet store and she would then take the money and she would buy just raw glass and her husband would cut it down and they would build tanks out of it. And she literally built uh, her entire fish room, which if you end up looking up Dorothy Reimer and things like that, you can see like, wow, she had a big fish room, stuff like that. And it all came from the first fish tank she ever bought. Very, very little money invested, but basically mystery snails and plants and things that she was making funded her entire basement full of fish tanks you know and i i always look at that and i go wow that is something that is so cool to me it's because you just didn't buy your way through it you earned your way through it and don't get me wrong i buy my way through stuff that's what i'm doing i, I i'm a business that's what i do but mad respect to people that can build their way through it or earn their way through it or whatever it is um because you know they learn a ton it was a slow road and it was a steady road and they're good at what they do you know if you if you can build an entire fish room off the back of mystery snails well guess what i think you're pretty good at making mystery snails and you know a lot about them you know and that's that's kind of what you want you know i've seen lots of people come and go they build a state-of-the-art fish room they spent five thousand seven thousand eight thousand dollars are gone within a year or two going oh i didn't make any money i i had the best equipment around i wasn't making money that was that was a waste of time it's like well that's that's you didn't know what you're doing you know it's just, it's no different than someone opening up uh you know the local ice cream place down the street and they, they put all this money into it and then they go out of business and you're going well you know it's alaska we don't sell that much ice cream or whatever the reason is like you weren't better than the other place you know just because you got the money to do it doesn't mean you'll be successful and uh yeah so if you don't have a local place it's a little rough do your market research i mean that's that's what it comes down to is are there enough places to sell this and you could even try like you know, if you were on it, maybe you would list, like, you're thinking, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to breed blue velvet shrimp, and I've got no local place to sell to. What if I make an ad for it on the local group or the local Craigslist and put the price you want to sell them for and see how many responses you get? And that can help shape whether it's worth it to bring in or not and do that for a month or two or just try and see if we can get the response. And you just go, oh, just tell them right now, like, oh, dang it, I just sold out. Darn it. And so you're kind of building some suspense, which is a good thing. It means like, oh, man, they must be selling fast. But you're also learning, are people actually going to buy this? Because if you just hop on your local club forum and things like that and you go, if I had this, would people buy it? People just go, yeah, I would. You know, if they don't know the price and things like that, everyone wants stuff but when it comes time to pull money out of their pocket a lot of times like well i don't have money right now oh i he you know it's so you know test the market first especially if you're making a bold decision um you know but if you're just breeding stuff you already like you got nothing to lose if you love rosy barbs and you start breeding rosy barbs whether someone buys them from you or not, you're already winning. You're, you bred something you like, you're enjoying it. There's nothing wrong with that. Hopefully other people want it too. Um, so let's talk about other things coming up in more episodes. I want to cover breeding fish outdoors. And uh, that kind of, what that, that's a whole, that's probably a little mini series or at least a few videos because there's a time when you can breed the fish outdoors which also happens to be the worst sales time in fish stores. 
then all those fish got to come back inside. So you got to have some, you know, storing capacity. Um, because if you just drop like, oh, I've got a thousand guppies. Are you ready for them store? They're going to go, nope. And that being said, you got, it's the one time you can compete with third, not third world countries. That's, that's not what I mean. Uh, foreign countries during the summer, usually you're getting free heat. You might be getting free food from bugs, you know, and, uh, you know, I feel like labor is cheaper because I don't mind standing outside in the sun and enjoying it versus getting rained on. That's horrible. So, you know, there's things like that to come up. Uh, I know I'm probably going to do some more videos on more things to breed. I know a lot of people want to know what other combos can you do, you know, that type of thing. Um... You know, be sure to ask me other aspects, you know, and we could do advanced topics like if you want to make a really hardy fish, you're going to have to subject it some, to some diseases and let fish die and bring them back from it to get them, you know, like let's say you know your local store just has a problem with ick, like man, they just, ick, run, ick runs rampant there because maybe the wholesaler they buy from is terrible. And you know it's likely that it's going to transfer on a net or something into your tank of guppies. You could make your guppies more ick resistant by giving them ick, letting them die naturally down until there's a few that survive. Breed those back up, do it again, and you can get a strain where you're like, man, those guppies never get ick. And all of a sudden, that's your ace in the hole. You know, you might go, well, yeah, we, we keep watching your guppies from the wholesaler die, but you've never lost one of these, right? Yeah, they are 65 cents. They're more expensive, but they actually are selling to the customer. That's a nice thing. So, yeah, let me know what other aspects you guys want to see. I'm going to keep making videos if you guys are enjoying these. And let me know if you are. You know, I don't want to get so stale where we're talking about such a, a niche thing that people aren't enjoying it. But I hope that the broad topics I can cover and, you know, People, as they bring up questions, more and more comes to light and things like that. And, you know, I don't want to get so far ahead that you can't use this knowledge. So I'm kind of sprinkling it in on Sundays between Real Fish Talk episodes and things like that. So make sure you check our other videos out, uh, especially the DIY section. If you're going to become a breeder, you should be checking out all the DIY videos. You should be checking out the how to breed videos, like let's say how to breed you know, guppies and shrimp and bristle nose that I've done. Uh, I've got more videos that I'm going to do on that kind of stuff, but, you know, all that stuff should help you get a little leg up. Um, you know, not that it's that hard to find that information. You can find it out there, but I find that it's a little easier through a video, and if you can watch it happening, it's better than reading about how someone did it. So, um, as always, you know, I'm appreciative of you guys following and subscribing and doing all those things, and so... Uh, I'll keep putting information out there until people don't want to see it anymore. So until next time, uh, you know, keep your hands in the tanks and uh, get to making some fish. But we'll see you later.